Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Murrow-Siler and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Shelley Proust will be speaking about Mormon Meadowmark butterflies, Apodamia mormo, an uncommon species in the prairie badlands. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. We have a great lineup of speakers scheduled. Join us on February 10th for a presentation by Laurel Berkeley, with a research wildlife biologist with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, about the effects of grazing on greater sage grouse and their habitat in central Montana. And you don't want to miss our March 25th webinar by Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards about biosecurity and invasive species. You can register for these webinars through the PCAP website. All past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel, and this webinar will be uploaded there in the near future. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. I'd also like to take a moment to thank um, our sponsors. Financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Eco-Friendly SASC, Pembina Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, SASC Energy, SaskTel, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsors are Camp Wilfrillo, Branchers Stewardship Alliance, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time. If you are on a cell phone, you can send your question by chat to the end of the presentation. Now a bit about today's presenter. Shelley Proust currently works with the Natural Resources Conservation Branch of Parks Canada. She also holds a position as an adjunct professor with the University of Alberta. In addition to Meadowmark butterflies, Shelley has conducted research on a variety of other species, such as greater sage grouse, swift fox, greater shorthorn lizards, and coyotes, as well as recovery planning for multiple species at risk in Grasslands National Park, including bison, prairie dogs, black-footed ferrets, and yellow-bellied racer snakes, among others. She is also very involved in animal welfare in an academic and research context. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Shelley. Great, thank you very much. I'll just uh, get my screen shown here. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm um, just my... Uh, screen here so that we can have uh, my uh, presentation up. First of all, thank you all for joining. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, for most of this presentation, I am going to um, just uh, shut down my webcam because I find that it tends to be a better presentation um, without you looking at me, but uh, without the bandwidth being uh, used up. So I'm just going to shut that off and start presenting. There we go. Please let me know if you have any problems uh, hearing me or uh, seeing the screen or anything like that. So today we're going to talk about the uh, Mormon Meadowmark butterfly, primarily in Grasslands National Park, but a little bit about the uh, areas around grasslands as well. Oh, I don't know if this is, let's see if it's having a little trouble here with it. Can you use the arrows on your keyboard? Yeah, oh, there we go. I'll try that. Thanks, Caitlin. So, of course, this is a, a research is a team effort. And uh, there was about five solid years when a, a real concerted effort was made by a group of us. So central to this work was my graduate student, Ashley Colwick. 
Also, I want to send a big shout out thank you to Joanne Janelle for her photos, because without them, this would have been a much more boring PowerPoint. So thank you to all those people on the screen and for the funding provided by University of Alberta, Interdepartmental Recovery Fund for work done on the PFRA, former PFRA pastures, Parks Canada and the Fish and Wildlife Fund of Saskatchewan. So the outline for today is basically we're going to look at a little bit of an overview of Kosiwik and try and understand how species become officially at risk. And before I got uh, involved in this type of work, it was just a little bit of a mystery. So I thought that uh, it might be helpful to clarify that. We're also going to look at Mormon metal mark distribution life history and habitat, and some of the Canadian firsts that uh, we discovered during our uh, journey with this species. We're going to look at some landscape scale modeling and surveys, some microhabitat modeling, some mark and recapture, and then talk a little bit about the Kosiwik reassessment. So in the Sarah cycle, that you see that there's assessment protection, recovery planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation. And then you reassess after you go through that whole process. So Kosiwik really is the very first step in this process. It was established in 1978, but it's now recognized as an official committee under SARA. A few key things, we'll talk a little bit about them, is that it is independent. It's scientific. It produces status reports on all the species that it assesses. And we have species assessments every six months. Originally, the plan was to have, or what was actually um, done originally was one year uh, assessments. Every one year, there would be an assessment. But so many species now need to be assessed and reassessed that the process has been um, meetings every six months. We tend to ev uh, evaluate and assess somewhere between 80 and 95 species a year. So the structure of COSIWIC, one of the most important things I think is that members are independent. They don't represent anybody, no interest groups, industry, or any um, group that might have special interests. So I am a member of COSIWIC now, this larger committee, but I am a member from Parks Canada. I do not represent Parks Canada. So evaluations are based on evidence from science, Aboriginal traditional knowledge and community knowledge. We ignore social, economic, and political considerations during these assessments. So information is derived from science or from observation, personal experience, or culture, uh, whatever those sources of information can help us to understand that species or a group of species. So we look at current past populations, distributions, abundance, habitat use, availability, life history traits, ecological relationships, and potential threats to species survival. So there are 46 members, but there are only 31 votes. However, when we actually get together for the meetings twice a year, there are about 60 people sitting around the COSIWIC table. And that's because there are actually two representatives from each federal, provincial, and territorial jurisdiction, two co-chairs from each species specialist subcommittee, and two co-chairs from the Aboriginal Traditional Knowledge Subcommittee. But all these pairs only have one vote between them. So you can see that it's a really diverse group of people and that the federal government, even though Environment Canada oversees COSI, there are only four total votes in this process. So this is the structure of COSIWIC in terms of the committees that feed into that large committee, that 60 people around the table committee. 
There are 10 uh, groups of specialists, birds, vascular plants, amphibians and reptiles, terrestrial mammals, marine mammals, marine fishes, freshwater fishes, mollusks, mosses and lichens, and arthropods. And some of these have um, been added um, you know, in the last several decades because the original Kosiwa Committee considered a much smaller subset of species. So just a point of interest, we are looking for co-chairs for about half of these SSCs. So if anyone out there is interested, please go to the Kosiwik website for more information or just contact me and I can uh, point you in the right direction. So assessment criteria uh, is based on the criteria from IUCN. So we use multiple criteria because not all criteria are appropriate to all taxa. All species being assessed have to be evaluated against each of these criterions. And meeting any one of them qualifies a species for listing at a certain level of threat. So this is a very, very abbreviated version of the criteria that we use. We have uh, each one of these has multiple subsets and divisions underneath it so we can tease down to what are the actual causes as, as close as we can determine to why a species is at risk. So at the end of the day, the assessment categories are um, determined based on those criteria I just mentioned. So extinct is basically a species that no longer exists anywhere on Earth. Extirpated is a species that no longer exists in the wild in Canada, but it occurs somewhere else in the world. Endangered is a species that is facing imminent extirpation or extinction. Threatened is a species that is likely to become endangered if limiting factors aren't reversed. Special concern is it's a species that we really have to watch because it has characteristics that make it really sensitive to either human activities or natural events like floods or um, drought or whatever may be uh, a serious risk to it. Not at risk, that's a fun one when we actually get to determine that a species is not at risk. And then we have data deficient and that's a species for which there is insufficient scientific information to actually determine the status. And uh, these are the ones that I always tell potential grad students that I think are the most fun to look into because you get to be a little bit of a Darwin when you work with these species. So the number of species at risk from our last COSIWIC assessment uh, in December, the results came out. We have 19 extinct species, 22 extirpated species, 369 endangered species, 197 threatened, 235 special concern for a total of 842. And 62 of uh, the species that have been assessed are determined to be data deficient. Just to give you an idea of how things are um, progressing or not progressing, in 2010, we had 615 species. In 2020, we had have 842. So that's about a 27% increase in just 10 years. So there is some good news that out of the species that we have assessed, 202 have been found not at risk. So this graph is, or this map is taken from the target to path, path uh, pathway to target one, excuse me. And it just gives you a rough idea of where species are basically located uh, or concentrated, species at risk are concentrated in Canada. And you can see the red areas are those that have the most species at risk. And part of this is due to um, the types of habitats like 
prairie is a more endangered ecosystem or the Carolinian forests in southern Ontario, they're a very rare type of ecosystem. But part of it is also related to the uh, settlement of humans, the impact of humans. So areas that are heavily settled um, all have a little bit more of uh, threats to species at risk and more species at risk in those areas. And then you have the red areas here, which th this is just a rough approximation from the pathway to target one, but the direct human impact is representative of things like seismic, oil and gas, mining. So we have heavily settled and then direct human impacts and then uh, areas that are relatively more pristine. So the Species at Risk Act uh, is where the species that are at risk get officially listed. So COSIWIC assesses these species and then makes a recommendation to the minister. Now, not all COSIWIC assessed species that get recommended actually get listed on SARA. So Schedule 1 of SARA means that a listed species gets two things enshrined in law, and that's protection, and the second are recovery measures. So once a species is listed, the measures to protect and recover automatically apply. So who gets a SARA legal listing? Well, not all species. Um, COSIWIC sends this to the minister and the minister has 90 days to say how the government will respond. How, And one of the examples is that the minister may feel that this species needs more consultation before listing, um, or there may be other reasons why um, a, a listing is delayed or a listing doesn't happen. So. Decisions on terrestrial species should be made within 24 months, uh, according to the Act, and for aquatic species within 36 months. So you can see here that there are certainly discrepancies in who gets a SARA legal listing. If you compare marine fishes, fishes M, with something like birds, you can see that there's quite a difference in the numbers that get listed. So who's responsible? Uh, fisheries and oceans are responsible for uh, aquatic species other than those that occur in Parks Canada uh, lands. Parks Canada are, is responsible for those in national parks, national marine conservation areas and national historic sites. And then Environment Canada is responsible for migratory birds and other species plus the overall administration of the, the process. So the Species at Risk Act has very uh, specific purposes. So the first is to prevent wildlife from being extirpated or becoming extinct in Canada. Secondly, it's to provide for the recovery of extirpated, endangered, or threatened species. And that is through a very specific process that we'll touch on in a second. And then it's also, uh, the purpose is to manage species of special concern so that they are prevented from becoming further at risk. So once the species is listed legally, a number of things get, um, set into motion. And that is the idea of, of uh, recovery planning, recovery strategies. So it's a legal requirement once a species is listed to develop and publish recovery strategies, action plans, and management plans. And the timelines are pretty specific. For an endangered species, it's one year extirpated and threatened is two years and special concern is three years. So those timelines are pretty ambitious. Uh, it's very difficult if you want to do um, 
you know, consultation and you want to involve uh, the larger community in terms of uh, uh, having a look and uh, commenting on the recovery strategy, getting those data together. So it's a pretty ambitious timeline and it is definitely one of the shortcomings of this process. And there's been a lot of talk about extending those timelines to something that is a little bit more manageable. So let's look at the Kosiwa and Sarah listing of the Prairie Mormon Metalmark butterfly. So this butterfly was designated by Kosiwik as threatened in May of 2003. In 2005, it was added to Schedule 1 of the Species at Risk Act. Now, um, Kosiwik has the mandate of reassessing species every 10 years. And that's a huge task. There's a, about 300 species that are due to be reassessed in the next five years or so plus all the species that are um, being reassessed or being assessed, pardon, for the first time. So it's quite a, an onerous task and Kosiwik is trying to figure out ways to make it a little bit more streamlined, especially for those species where things haven't changed very much for them. So in 2014, the status was re-examined and this butterfly was downlisted to special concern. And then the Sarah status was changed in February 2018. So right now we're in the process of uh, consulting on the management plan because it went down to special concern. It doesn't need a recovery strategy anymore, but a management plan. So essentially, uh, this talk is a little bit about what happened in between. So we took our cue for research from the National Recovery Strategy, which had really specific objectives for the recovery of the species. And Parks Canada was what we would call the SARA responsible agency tasked with achieving these objectives and goals. So basically in a nutshell, it was to map all the potential habitat in the known range, figure out if other populations existed outside of the known range, determine the population size of all known prairie colonies of butterflies. Well, little did we realize, as you will see when we put down that objective, identify and implement best management practices, determine how prairie populations are linked by dispersal to each other and to Montana, and then integrate this into multi-species action plan efforts. So the Canadian distribution of metalmark butterflies is in two separate populations. And these Canadian populations represent less than 1% of uh, North America's total population of metalmark butterflies, and even uh, some of them in South America. So it's 1% um, of really the global range. And as you can see, these populations in Canada really are at the far northern end of the distribution. So you can see that the southern mountain population circled in red and then the prairie population in the green uh, rectangle there. And Proshek uh, did some genetic work in 2013 and he found out that the populations in Saskatchewan are really not closely related to the BC populations that occur in the Similkameen and Okanagan Valleys. He also found out that the Saskatchewan butterflies are much more genetically diverse. So you can see that that BC population is relatively isolated. But in Saskatchewan, he found out that there's actually gene flow with several other Eastern populations in the United States. So in addition to being genetically different, the, they are also behaviorally different the two Canadian populations because they each use a slightly different host plant. So our focus today will of course be the prairie population and uh, we'll start out by looking a little bit at their life history and habitat. So in the two areas of Canada the habitat is quite similar. It's 
open, arid, badland type habitat that support the larval host plants, which are the branched umbrella plants here in Saskatchewan, and nectaring plants like the rubber rabbit brush. The prairie population is pretty much found on eroding clay slopes in the prairie badlands, but it is also found on more level terrain. Some of you will be familiar with this site from 70 Mile Butte in Grasslands National Park. And here you can really see the exposed eroded hillsides and slopes, often with barren clay or heavy clay soils. There are adjacent areas that are quite level where we have the branched umbrella plant as well. It's also known as the few flowered buckwheat. And these plants are quite common and widespread in many of the badland areas of Saskatchewan. But the key point is that not all of these patches have this butterfly. So it's quite a small butterfly. And I don't know if my, this is it, the prairie population. If you can see my pointer. Um, it's quite dark brown dorsally with a lot more gray ventrally, but the common name refers to the shiny metallic spots or streaks that are often found on many members of this family. It's a big family of butterflies. So I included two pictures top right and bottom left that show the beautiful metallic markings that some of these butterflies have and which gave way to the name of metal marks. Like all butterflies, it has four life stages. And prior to 2009 in Canada, only one of those life stages had ever been observed. So in Saskatchewan, the Mormon metal marks have a flight period from late July to mid-September. And the peak of the activity is really in August. If you want to see metal mark butterflies, you should go into the badlands in August, especially after the first week. There is a staggered emergement, emergence rather of adults, and each of these butterflies lives about 10 days. Mating typically occurs within about three days of the adult emergence, and during courtship, males chase the female, they land on uh, usually uh, some sort of vegetation and then copulate and eggs are laid in August or September. So you can see some of these beautiful butterflies here. So during this study, we had a, a number of firsts, which were quite exciting. Uh, in the survey work on 2000, in 2007, we found butterflies flying for the uh, first time on July 23rd, which was the earliest observations ever documented in Canada. And it was a very hot, hot, dry summer, and that may have had something to do with the early emergence. Again, in the summer of 2009, surveys were conducted to find the elusive caterpillar. These caterpillars are crepuscular. That means that they are active during dawn and dusk. So unlike the butterfly stage, caterpillars are hidden during the day. So there were a lot of very early mornings and late nights and lots and lots of patients, which eventually paid off um, because we did document the first caterpillar ever observed in Canada in Grasslands National Park. And here you can see Katie Peterson hard at work searching for these uh, elusive caterpillars. And in fact, the first time we thought we saw a caterpillar, it was so tiny that we had to actually look at it under a microscope. Um, it was probably a very early instar or stage of the caterpillar. We did take the caterpillar and put it right back on its original plant. So. The other thing that we discovered during mark and recapture surveys in 2011 was the observation of butterflies laying eggs. 
Now this had never been observed before in Canada, so it was pretty exciting uh, first. We also found out that the eggs were laid directly on soil and rocks, as you can see in these photographs, and not just on the branched umbrella host plant. Now it was assumed from other studies of this species uh, in North America and South America that they always laid their eggs on the host plant. So using different habitats by the butterfly in Canada was uh, a very, very different behavior. Um, so you can see here that in this one, it, it's uh, laying the eggs in a little bit of a, uh, looks like a clump of, of soil and, um, and some, uh, some root material. So we have a number of theories why this behavior is so different, but of course, we don't know for sure. So one of the big questions is that we don't understand or know how these animals overwinter. So we don't know if it's eggs or early instar caterpillars, and the instar is just a developmental stage in between each molt of the caterpillar. So in the U.S. range, the larvae are known to hibernate in stems, on flower heads, under leaf litter, and then they emerge in the spring to feed. So we're not sure if that happens here or if it's the egg that overwinters, but depending on what they need for overwintering, climate change could influence, for better or for worse, their overwintering success. So in July of, uh, rather in 2002, only six sites were known within Grasslands National Park. And these were discovered primarily by amateur naturalist and local legend, Reverend Ron Hooper. And it is one of my great regrets that I never got to meet Reverend Hooper because he really was instrument, instrumental in the things that we found out about this uh, species of butterfly. By 2008, when the recovery strategy was published, there were only eight known Mormon metal mark colonies, and we had fewer than 50 geo-referenced butterfly observations. So in an effort to assess and map all the potential habitat outside of the known range in 2008, we started to do surveys in unsurveyed areas in grasslands and the former PFRA pastures of Val Marie and Beaver Valley. And you can see these are the PFRA pastures. I took this um, map from a multi-species action plan that Environment Canada has produced, just to show you in relation to Grasslands National Park West Block here. So because there was so much badland that had potential metal mark occupancy, these surveys contributed to a landscape scale predictive model developed by my graduate student, Ashley Colwick. And that was really instrumental in um, guiding our surveys in subsequent years. So it greatly increased the ability to focus our survey effort. So she used two models, uh, resource selection function and random forest to study the relationship between butterfly presence and environmental predictors. And you can see here that she looked at uh, a variety of things like greenness, wetness, slope, uh, topographical relief and the area of solar radiation from digital elevation models. Now, the absence of vegetation was the single most important predictor of butterfly presence. Um, but the butterfly in general is associated with dry, yet potentially shaded regions, uh, regions that might experience shade over the day due to their relief, with moderate slope and low vegetative uh, cover. And the idea that 
um, some of the areas may have more shade really makes a lot of sense if you uh, go out and experience the gale force winds of uh, a summer on the prairies. So a lot of these colonies kind of wrap around hillsides and when the wind was really up, uh, you could observe the butterflies flying and feeding and doing what butterflies do in the lee uh, of the wind. So where it was calm, it might be a little bit more shaded because it had um, the slope, but it also protected them from the wind. So Ashley constructed a predictive map in both grasslands and Valmarie community pasture using each of those models. And then in 2012, we validated the model performance by searching for host plants and butterflies in the sites that each of those models predicted would have butterflies present. So we looked at areas with a greater than 60% relative probability of presence. So the results were that we visited 168 sites that were predicted to have butterflies. So the RSF model was accurate 64% of the time, while the random forest was correct about 76% of the time. Since the random forest model was consistently uh, a better model than the RSF, it was used to randomly select sites predicted to have no butterflies because you need to test both of those assumptions where the butterflies are but also where they aren't. So 76 sites that were randomly chosen and predicted not to have butterflies were visited and this model was accurate 92 percent of the time at predicting that there would not be butterflies there. So the findings indicated that butterfly presence was associated with moderately sloped dry habitat with little vegetation, low solar radiation with higher shaded relief values, and of course the presence of the host plant, which is you know, an obvious important assumption as this butterfly is obligate to this plant. However, the key thing is not all, not all colonies of the umbrella plant have the butterfly. So the, we tested the model the following summer as well, and uh, it performed very well, but not as well as the original um, summer. So the bottom line is this model increased our ability to find butterflies on the ground. And as a result of combined surveys, primarily by Ashley and also Kurt Illibrand, uh, within and around grasslands and the former Valmarie PFRA pasture, there are over 1,500 distinct geo-referenced uh, butterfly locations, and we have delineated over 150 colonies. So these data led to the designation of critical habitat in Grasslands National Park and surrounding areas in the West Block and also in the East Block. So you can see here uh, basically critical habitat in the West Block and critical habitat in the East Block. So during uh, this research, as I mentioned, it was quite apparent that not all umbrella plant colonies have butterflies. So we wanted to refine the habitat characteristics that these butterflies needed in order to live in these uh, colonies of the Areogonum plant. So in an effort to do this, attributes of occupied umbrella plant colonies were compared to unoccupied umbrella plant colonies. And the presence of metal marks in these colonies reflects a combination of topographic soil and biotic variables. And of course, the host plant presence is a key predictor, but it's not sufficient to characterize habitat occupied by the butterfly because lots and lots of umbrella plant patches don't have butterflies. 
So the butterflies are found disproportionately in patches of umbrella plants that had higher percentage of bare ground, a greater slope, south to southwesterly aspect, lower than average elevation, lower soil nitrogen, and higher acidity. Another question was, can we estimate uh, in any reasonable way how how many butterflies are in a colony. So we started to do mark and release, Ash, Ashley and her crew started to do mark and release and recapture in August 2011. So they caught a total of 885 butterflies and, uh, and marked them and re-caught 142 of them. So you can see here that with 800, over 800 butterflies, it was a very complex series of colors and dots and positioning on the different butterflies so that you could actually identify each individual animal. So the results here show we had, um, we had four plots in Grasslands National Park and three plots in Val Marie Community Pasture. And our aim here was to see if we could correlate colony size roughly to uh, population size. Now, of course, there's all sorts of other variables in here, but you can see that certain, if you look, oops, let's see if I can go back forward here. You can see that um, we have a rough estimation of population size here for each of the plots. And then this has been translated into the number of butterflies per hectare. And so some sites were obviously more productive than other sites. And some of the sites were also larger. So uh, it's giving us a little bit uh, of a different uh, number at the end of the day. So the work did pay off in terms of lowering the status designation to special concern, but it really wasn't because we implemented very specific management strategies to increase the population numbers. So our team rather dedicated itself to the recovery strategy objectives in, in order to, to more accurately determine what the state of this species was in southern Saskatchewan. So you can see here in the Kosiwik reassessment that they uh, noted that because of the extensive surveys in the last decade, and that was the team that I've been talking about, the known population of this butterfly is now large enough that it no longer meets the criteria for threatened. So that's a good news story, something that's been downlisted. And even if that was uh, due to just finding more uh, out about this species. So when a species is downlisted to special concern, uh, critical habitat does get decommissioned. However, it's still really important information for good management of this species. So if it ever did get uplisted to threatened again, when we hope that never happens, the critical habitat could be resurveyed randomly, see if it still has butterflies and it could be reinstated pretty, pretty easily because it's, uh, it's mapped pretty exactly. So with this butterfly, it was uh, such an interesting process to discover lots of new things about this butterfly, to understand it a little bit better, and um, to think about ways that it can be managed in perpetuity so that it doesn't ever become uplisted again to threatened. And the great thing is that most of the area where this species occurs in Saskatchewan that we know of, I mean, there's also other unsurveyed areas over Saskatchewan that may very well have this butterfly. Uh, it would be really interesting to go have a look. But where the 
population, the majority of the population that we know about occurs, there really aren't that many threats in terms of human caused threats. There may be some threats in terms of uh, climate change. Uh, that's, that's something that is an issue for, um, for a lot of, of species and, and a lot of prairie species. So things like overwintering, how does that change in the light of climate change? Um, and that is uh, a key question for a number of species at risk, including the greater shorthorn lizard. We think that perhaps overwintering may be the most uh, dangerous, for lack of a better word, time in, in many species life histories because a lot of uh, mortality can occur during the overwintering period. So it was a, a, it was a, a very interesting species. I, it was uh, fun to find out a lot about it and it was really rewarding to see that it actually got downlisted. So I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions that people might have. First of all, thank you very much, Shelley. This was a really awesome presentation, really in depth about the Kosubic process and um, Mormon metal marks. So thank you. You're very welcome. Um, we do have a couple questions from listeners here. Um, I will just pull them up. So one listener named Graham would like to know, do you think that the Coast Week naming and ranking of species is an effective conservation effort slash model should we not be more focused on threatened and high important habitats provincially nationally globally um sorry <laughs> it's just cut off here to ensure species conservation okay yeah very good question um i think that part of protecting habitat is understanding what the species needs in terms of habitat. And the Kosiwik process, the whole idea of habitat, what their needs are and what their threats are, um, is, is very important in terms of trying to understand what what do we need to protect? What threats do we need to mitigate? And how can we actually do that? It also helps us to understand whether or not a species uh, is really at risk. Do we have uh, a history of severe decline, severe fluctuations? Are they very um, susceptible to natural events or human caused events? So all those uh, data, all that information I think is critical in trying to understand what habitats we need to protect. And many species have different habitat needs for different portions of their life history. And so that helps us to understand it as well. Now, having said that, protecting habitat is crucially important. And when we look at some umbrella species, we do have uh, quite a bit of habitat, let's say sage grouse, for example. If you protect uh, sage grouse habitat, then a lot of other species fall under that umbrella. So I think both processes are important, and I think, I would hope, that the COSI process feeds very naturally into that um, habitat protection and what we need to protect and why we need to protect it. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Elena would, um, is that she was surprised to see Sharpie on butterfly wings and such an interesting technique. Uh, do you think this was the best way to mark butterflies or would you recommend any other ways? I think when you had uh, eight over 800 butterflies to mark, I know some, some people use the technique of um, notching wings, but that would that would be almost impossible to do with over 800 butterflies. So I think we had different colors and different combinations. And um, if I recall correctly, I think because these butterflies are so short-lived, I think that was actually a water-based color. 
Um, other, there are other techniques where you can use a bit of a polymer, but that we felt that was way too heavy for uh, a fragile butterfly wing. But if anyone knows a better way out there, uh, please speak up. We, we couldn't figure out a, a better way. We thought that was probably the best way. Thanks for that answer. I know we do have a few other butterfly experts on the line, so um, yeah. we'll see if any other answers come in. <laughs> um, right. Shelley, with your talk about uh, Kosi Wick, it's kind of depressing how many species are becoming more and more endangered and, and the number of species increasing. How do you keep up your hope <laughs> and optimism? Yeah, you know, um, it, that, that is is a really good question and you do have to kind of work at, at being positive sometimes. Uh, there are definitely some stories that are harder to take than others. I think this is a, a good news story. This is a happy story um, of this butterfly. Um, part of, I guess part of it is you just do the best you can do in terms of um, the different ways that you can support uh, species at risk or species in general and you know that may be as simple as recycling and uh, you know buying local and doing what you can do but I think every little bit counts and every little bit that people do is an important little bit um, and so we just keep working towards um, recovering these species and we have to celebrate when we find that species are not at risk. 202 of the species that we assessed were not at risk, so that's a good news story. Um, yeah, and just try and focus on, on things that are more positive. Some days it's hard, yeah. Uh, thanks for that answer. <laughs> um, oftentimes our listeners are looking for things that they can do to help species, you know, um, building bee houses or planting um, native prairie gardens. Is there anything that people can do um, to help more metal marks? Yeah, I th I think that, uh, you know, they're, they're doing fairly well. In BC, they're not doing well. I think in an area like that, we have to look very carefully at areas that we develop um, because developing um, transportation corridors, uh, you know, erosion, all those sorts of things that uh, affect that natural habitat there, are uh, really putting that species at risk. So I think in that case, we have to be advocates for places that are suitable for adult and places that may not be suitable. And also things as simple as trying to get rid of non-native species, be those plants or insects or animals, um, that can really have a profound effect on the survival and recovery of certain species. I mean, the yellow sweet clover, uh, I think if you look certain years in the, it's incredibly invasive. And I know that Grasslands is working hard to try and get rid of that species in really specific areas uh, where the metal marks are and also where the lizards are, the greater shorn lizards, because those two live in, in the same types of habitats. So um, things like that can make a, a pretty big difference. Thanks for that answer. I think a lot of people don't realize the um, the impact of invasive species on habitat and examples like the Mormon metal mark and sweet yellow clover. I think that's, it really puts it into perspective. So yeah. yeah. One of our listeners named Nicholas is wondering if you have any ideas why they don't occur in southeastern Alberta. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm not sure if they never occurred there. Um, I think maybe it might have something to do with where the areogonum occur in southern Alberta and maybe patches being healthy or not healthy or large enough maybe they were there and blinked out, but we did do a few concerted uh, surveys to try and find the species there and uh, we, we weren't successful. So I think it may have a little bit to do with some of those habitat features that uh, I talked about 
today in the talk and also maybe some of the microhabitat features of, um, you know, uh, the soil pH and what makes that plant grow, uh, you know, robust, healthy in, uh, in that type of in environment. Yeah, they seem to I don't know if anyone... Mm -hmm. I was just saying, they seem to be a specialist species. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If anybody else out there has any ideas, let me know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see if anyone writes in. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there a difference in the species between the two different populations? Um, like if you were to have, um, you know, a taxidermied one from Saskatchewan and one from BC in your hand, could you tell the difference or are they identical? It's just the geographic habitat that's different. You know, that's, that's a really good question because I've never had one of each in my hand to, to look at. I have seen them in, in photographs. Me, a really, you know, uh, adept Mormon metal mark expert could. I don't think I could because um, they are fairly, they look fairly similar. Yeah, thanks for that answer. I know it's a hard one. <laughs> Um, a listener named Peter is wondering if there is much overlap of the habitats of metal marks and shorthorn lizards and um, search efforts be concurrent. Yeah, great question. Yeah, they, yes, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, they do exist in the same types of habitats and we, we did that very thing whenever we were looking for butterflies, um, we would uh, opportunistically um, mark down any lizards that we found and we typically often found lizards on our search for butterflies. So we, the, the lizards exist in a slightly different habitat so you won't normally find lizards in the branched umbrella plant colonies but you can find them around those colonies and occasionally in them but their habitat requirements are slightly different so uh, but yes if you're searching for one you will often find the other that makes sense but you can't exactly search for both at the same time then yeah it's a bit tough yeah yeah best to focus yeah. on um, next question from a listener is, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of all the different species that you've worked with, how did you get to become an expert in so many, such a variety of species? Well, I, I, to be honest, I'm an expert in all of them, that's for sure. <laughs> I've just had the, the, very, the very good fortune of being able to work on a variety of them. And a lot of it has to do with working with recovery teams that, recovery teams, there are not so many of them anymore. But when I first started, when I was writing a lot of recovery strategies, we had recovery teams of experts in that species. And so we would combine our, uh, our group knowledge and try and figure out what are the best ways that we can recover this species. So my, my background is I did my master's on swift fox and I did my PhD on coyotes. So I did have a little bit of uh, species at risk experience before I started with Parks Canada. And then with this Parks Canada job, uh, when I started my um, assignment, for lack of a better word, or the area I was responsible with was the, the prairies, so Grasslands National Park. So that um, was, yeah, I mean, it was an amazing experience to work with Grasslands. It's just a wonderful park and wonderful people. And so that has been a real pleasure. The flip side is that there's lots of endangered species, unfortunately, because prairie is an endangered type of ecosystem. So in that respect, I guess by virtue of where I was working, I ended up working with a variety of species uh, at risk. Oh, that's great to hear. And as, as Shelley knows, I'm not sure if uh, our attendees do, I actually live um, very close to Grasslands National Park. Yeah. So I always love uh, when people talk highly of it. <laughs> well, I think 
that's all the time that we have um, today, Shelly. So I know you and I have been in touch for a long time about um, doing a webinar or a presentation of some sort for our speaker series. So um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your really busy schedule with all of your recovery work with COSWIC for doing this presentation for us. So um, thank you, Shelly. Um, to all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for catching our uh, live broadcast today. Uh, we have another speaker series coming Coming up in February, really hope you can make it there. It'll be great. We don't get a lot of sage grouse presentations, so I'm always really excited. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Quite a few people are typing in, Shelley. Thank you for the great presentation. So, thank oh, you. You're so welcome. Thank you for joining. Bye. Bye.